David Lyons. This is the RSL Today Show. I, I like that name, Keith. How are you? RSL Today this evening, David. This evening, yes. Yeah. But it, it's a good name. And uh, yeah, here we are, mate. A week and a half from Anzac Day. and uh, We're back again. <laughs> we're back again. We're picking up the pieces. and uh, We've had some good rain. Uh, my word, yeah. Needed it. Needed yeah. a lot of rain. Yeah. yeah, the cockies are getting the first, uh, the sowing in. Yes. Yeah, yeah so that's uh, good. Very good. Uh, David, uh, our phone number at State Branch is 8100-7300. Our email is admin at rslsa.org.au. The website is rslsa.org.au. And we have Facebook, Twitter and, and uh, Instagram. We, and, uh, we have. Uh, uh, just going through my notes, a few things perhaps that I didn't uh, mention last week. And I'll give people a heads up that uh, uh, there's a, a local documentary filmmaker, Ash Starkey. And yes, he, no he Ash, produced yes. the documentary The First Anzac Day, which yes. was October 1915. And it was about a commemoration here in, in South Australia. So the men are still fighting, uh, but here in South Australia they had a commemoration and a big big celebration, and yeah. it was the actually the eight-hour day public holiday, which they said, Look, what, what should we, can we rename that? The union said, yes, you can, uh, and they called it Anzac Day. So Amazing, isn't it? There you go. But, uh, yeah. you know, things have changed since then, but it was a very fair type, fairground type atmosphere. So uh, uh, Ash produced a, a DVD, which we'll um, find a bit more about in weeks to come and, uh, uh, and tell people that. And the other thing then that is being fairly successful or successful is the RSL Employment Program, yeah. which uh, aims to take people who have uh, uh, left defence or are about to transition uh, to get them into meaningful employment. Uh, and to do that, all they do is go to our website Site and uh, link through to um, to the employment program site. Register their interest. They'll then be contacted by someone who uh, run through uh, and assess them, um, work on what has to be worked on, uh, and see what we can do. And as of about a month ago, we had about eleven or twelve people on the books, and one successful uh, positioning. Yeah, and, uh, small steps. And then there was a, an advert placed for a, a case manager, so there'll be a case manager in South Australia mm. uh, to handle these. So uh, uh, well done. We couldn't have done it without the assistance of uh, RSL Queensland, who developed it, have had it running for a few years, and we're the first state out of there. It's, it's good, isn't it, uh, yeah. to yeah. do it. Uh, Some positive news coming out of there. Uh, yeah, David, um, have you got any announcements? Well, yes, just one. Uh, I'd just like to uh, comment on the, the passing of, of one of the staunch supporters of the Combined Deck Services mess. Uh, um, a 93-year-old lady who used to come every month to our luncheons, um, Barbara Medhurst, uh, Medhurst OAM, um, lovely lady, and passed away a couple of weeks back. Um, and she'll be short, sorely missed. She was a really yeah. delight to, to talk to, and she was part of the Clan Campbell Association. Oh, they're, a, they're quite, yes. a, yeah. quite a group, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, um, so Vale um, Barbara, and she had a good and meaningful life. Um oh. We're privileged again. Um, our guest from last week, uh, Commander Alastair Cooper, has come back. Uh, Alastair, are you there? I am indeed, David. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. Welcome back to the, to the show. Um, thank you. As we were saying um, the other day, it, it goes very quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> so we, we do apologise if we cut you off rather shortly last week. You probably saved everybody, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if I know uh, someone thorough like you... Uh, Commander Cooper, you've probably done some research on on the coin uh, <laughs> placement on the keels that I inadvertently, or not inadvertently, or deliberately threw it at you. But uh, what can you tell us about that tradition? You, you, you bounced me, absolutely. Yeah, I did. Um, yeah. I, 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 the, the, the answer about the coins is that they're placed um, uh, by, to, uh, to provide good luck, as a, or as a token of good luck, um, uh, for the for the ship and its and its construction, often by the youngest apprentice in the shipyard, 
and and by a more senior person uh, in the Navy's case, often the uh, the chief of the Navy. So, um, so that's a little bit more about the uh, the coin laying and, uh, and 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 you know sort of the councillor and, and all of my friends who've given me a hard time for not knowing says I'll be say I'll be okay. You'll never get caught again. You'll know. <laughs> <laughs> not about that one. Yeah. It was interesting the photograph that was placed on Facebook. The um Apprentice was a female welder, I think, in about a fourth year, and I can't remember who the who the other person was, but I don't reckon it was chief of navy. So, um, what a marvelous tradition! It, it is, and if you're looking, at, if you're talking about the most uh, the most recent um, coin, uh, keel laying for what will be the future, um, well, the, the second um, uh, Arafura class Corvette in the air, um, I think uh, that was all done virtually. So. Oh. As, as Anzac Day uh, traditions evolved um, to cope with the COVID-19 um, uh, responses, so so the traditions for, for, for warships have, have evolved as well. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Aren't we all, aren't we all learning? It's, things are changing. So. It's a steep learning curve. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, look, uh, we... Um, finished up last week talking about the oral history program, the Navy oral history program, and there was so much more to talk about. So uh, um, please um, continue. Yeah, continue where you left off. <laughs> yeah, well, look, one of the things that, uh, that uh, you asked me uh, after the show was, was whether or not people could have access to it. Um, the, the, the short answer is, is, is yes, but always there's a but afterwards. There are some things in the oral history collection which are, are publicly available, others which are will be publicly available in time because we've, we've asked people to be as frank and fearless as they, that they're happy to be about their, their recollections. Um, and, and there are other things where um, they relate to, I guess, classified activities and, and, and that's a different story again. Um, but when we set the oral history program up, we did it in conjunction with the Australian War Memorial because they are, uh, they have a, a, an archive of, of world standard, um, and we thought that they would be able to preserve the the records created through the program. So, uh, I guess if people are, are, are looking for it, I'd, I'd encourage them to start with the Australian War Memorial. Um, increasingly, things will be available there, um, and and when you go to the War Memorial's um, uh, archive, either either physically in Canberra, or, or they've got a massive amount online, um, including Navy's reports of proceedings, which are a, a, a wonderful resource, um, then you can you can find out lots more there. Alistair, one of the other things that we were um, tossing up in the air uh, after last week's show, um, you mentioned these podcasts. Now, that, that interests me a fair bit. What, what is your involvement with these podcasts? What are they about? So, I have I have helped with the creation of a small number of podcasts in a much, much larger series. Um, so at the Uni University of New South Wales uh, in Canberra, they have a naval studies group and uh, led by uh, the retired Vice Admiral Peter Jones, um, uh, the Naval Studies Group, the Australian Naval Institute, the Navy Sea Power Centre, the Naval Historical Society and the Submarine Institute of Australia have put together a really great video and pos podcast series on a whole range of different events in Australia's naval history. So some of the ones that I've been involved in have been uh, have looked at the Coast Watches during World War II, um, at, at HMAS Adelaide's operations um, to um, to encourage New Caledonia to go with the Free French instead of. Uh, the Vichy French in 1940, yes, um, yeah. which which was you know, one of Australia's first forays into into its own international relations and foreign policy, independent of Britain. So uh, th there are all sorts of things like that. But if you Google Australian Naval History podcasts on whatever platform you use for your podcasts, you will find I think they m must be up to their fourth or fifth season now, oh, uh, wow. and they're they're excellent. Is there a Facebook that we could share? Uh, do you know if, if, if the podcasts have a Facebook entry? I don't think they have a Facebook entry. You can see them on YouTube um, and, and, as I say, just in whatever um, platform you use for, for podcasts, just Google Australian Naval History Podcasts mm. and you will find them very rapidly. Excellent. Right. 
That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Have you come across Mr. Burridge? I think his name is with the Coast Watchers. He oh. keeps sending us emails. He, he must be a marvellous man. I think he's an elderly gent, but he's written, he's got a website, and uh, every now and again he'll send, send us an email, say, look, no need to reply, but he's bringing you up to speed on it. So uh, uh, I should give him another run for his money. I've no doubt he's a good guy. and You're, you're, you're probably, again, just sort of you know, exploring the, 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 the gaps in my memory. You, it's, or maybe there are larger gaps than I anticipated. <laughs> I doubt that very much. <laughs> anyway, um, that's interesting. Um, now, Alistair, as as we mentioned briefly last um, last week, you were scheduled to come in earlier this year and, and uh, have us interview you, but you were delayed because of the bushfires, uh, predominantly on KI, but but as Cudley Creek as well. Uh, how did uh, the Navy in South Australia um, become involved in that? What what did they do? So the Navy's role uh, in South Australia was in in really three different aspects. Um, it, the first, we had some some wonderful um, medical specialists who deployed um, over to Kangaroo Island and assisted with um, uh, the responses there. Um, so supporting the, the the activities of of the South Australian Emergency Services who who led the response. Um, the second is we had a number of people who who uh, supported the uh, public affairs um, uh, and headquarters responses here, uh, and the final bit is we spent a fair bit of time um, working out um, whether or not um, uh, any of any of the ships that were deployed around the coast could be um, uh, could be employed um, or, or would be required here. Uh, and a lot of preparation goes into making sure that those things uh, are, are possible. So we supported um, some hydrographic surveys to to look at um, whether amphibious um, uh, activities could be could be supported. Uh, in the end, uh, they weren't required, um, but um, it certainly kept us busy, and it was a you know, a, a very interesting activity. But uh, yeah. one where I guess we were really just um, happy to be able to. To, to provide support to the community in a time when it was really very difficult. Yeah, that's good. That's it really is adapting, uh, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's adapt and overcome. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw on Facebook that one of you, a doctor went over there. I saw him in his... Uh, uh, Navy service uniform. I guess he was one of our local doctors here, uh, but he was deployed over there. Yeah, we had a, a doctor and a nurse um, and and it, it's something which is really quite um, remarkable. The number of um, people in the uh, the emergency services who who serve in both civilian and service capacities. Um, so I think it speaks speaks very highly of the sort of culture of of being willing. To, to, to help no matter what the circumstances yeah. in those sort of people. Yeah, I thought it was great because normally the public don't get to see very much of our uh, defence forces and uh, through Cuddly Creek and the uh, and Kangaroo Island they got up close and personal with them and they didn't know a reservist from a regular or a full-timer. Oh, well, that's, that's something that I, I think... Uh, uh, well, if we've we've talked history, and you know, sort of, um, particularly in the in the army, um, th- there's a great tradition of of Australia having citizen shol- soldiers and so forth. But in in more recent times, um, the defence forces has adopted what it calls a total workforce model, yes. where we we, um, we I guess we we give bureaucratic recognition to to what we all instinctively know that there are many ways that people can contribute some full-time, some part-time, um, all manner of different shapes, shapes and sizes, and, and that's what makes us a, a better and a stronger organisation. Exactly, yeah. Alistair, it's, it's time again, and look, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut it short there, but uh, thank you very much for coming in, and I'd love to re-interview you again. Please stay on the line. Uh, Keith, I'll say um, good night. Yeah, and, I'll, uh, I'll do the same. We'll keep Alistair on the line, talk to him uh, off air, and, uh, and uh, it's good night from all of us. Thank you.